Services. We will look at the building codes and standards in the context of minimum code requirements, as well as specific recommendations beyond those minimums to enhance fire safety. We will review non-combustible building systems and finishes, and we'll look at four case studies before concluding and addressing any questions you may have. And we'll first start now looking at the impact of natural disasters, including structure fires, as well as wildfires. So according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, 2017 was the costliest year on record for natural disasters in the United States. And that came with a price tag of at least 306 billion US dollars. And this record total came from 16 separate large loss disasters, each exceeding $1 billion in damages. Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico in that year of 2017 were devastated by hurricanes, and one of the worst U.S. wildfire seasons in years ignited almost 2 million acres of land, resulting in $17 billion worth of losses. We do have data in progress from NOAA in 2020. As of uh, mid-July, there have been already 10 natural disaster events with losses exceeding $1 billion uh, affecting the U.S., and overall, these events have resulted in the deaths of 80 people and had significant economic effects on the areas impacted. And of course, this is not taking into account wildfire season, which started uh, on the West Coast in the fall of this year. Meanwhile, with the boom in multifamily construction in the United States, the last several years has also recorded a disturbing number of wood-framed apartment fires and direct property damage from fires is only part of the story. Uh, according to the report, total cost of fire in the United States by the Fire Protection Research Foundation and NFPA, the total cost of fires in 2014 was $328.5 billion. And that's equating to almost 2% of the US GDP. And this cost comes not just from property damage, but also from fire protection expenditures. So the cost for firefighting, um, fire suppression activities, um, the infrastructure, insurance, etc. And so that expense was $273 billion. And then the losses, uh, including deaths, injuries, and property loss were in the total of $55.4 billion. And it's important to note that According to the US Fire Administration, fire kills more Americans than all other natural disasters combined. Most fires are occurring in residential buildings, including single family and multifamily homes. And communities really struggle to cope with these devastating wildfires, house fires, and massive apartment fires that take the lives and injure thousands of occupants and firefighters. They also displace thousands of residents and shut down nearby businesses, and sometimes roadways. And legislators have been not so fast to react to this epidemic, and it's really left the design community to incorporate sound fire safety practices into their projects to minimize fire risk. And there are more statistics here from NFPA. In 2017, there were almost 500,000 structure fires uh, causing over 2,800 civilian deaths. Uh, more than 12,000 injuries, and again, billions of dollars in damages. NFPA estimates that uh, over 260,000 fires occurred in homes, resulting in more than 2,000 fatalities, um, many thousands of injuries, and over $6 billion in damages. And 95,000 of those fires occurred in apartment buildings, resulting in 340 deaths, um, over 300, over 3,000 injuries, and $1.6 billion in damages. And over time, if you look at the statistics put out every year in the last few years as well, property damages from fire have been increasing. And as a result of building relaxed building codes, developers have actually increased the use of combustible wood frame construction for multifamily construction. This is not only apartments and condos, but also hotels, dormitories, and long-term care facilities. And this has resulted in a rash of fires across the country uh, that are reducing buildings to ashes, putting lives and communities at risk. 
According to the article, America is Burning by Build With Strength, the recent spate of fires in low and mid-rise structures throughout the country is really raising questions and concerns about the safety of wood frame buildings. And not only are these wood frame buildings total losses, but they often cause considerable damage to surrounding buildings and property. Communities and surrounding businesses don't often survive these fires. The businesses and their residents must endure not only the disruption of construction of the original building, but they have to endure further losses from business disruption and relocation while either the new building is rebuilt after one of these devastating fire events or salvaging operations are taking place. And there have been several notable apartment fires over the last several years. Um, and we're seeing now more than ever these multifamily conflagrations uh, again throughout the United States. Um, some examples, the Edgewater, New Jersey fire, the Da Vinci fire in Los Angeles, um, the College Park, Maryland student housing fire, and earlier this year in, in January, the Alexandria, Virginia fire. And there's been a number uh, of fires in that same vein uh, throughout the year. And insurers are beginning to understand the risk posed by these massive wood buildings. A recent study was conducted by NRMCA to determine if insurance companies offered lower insurance rates for structures built using non-combustible materials uh, for both builder's risk insurance and commercial property insurance. And one of the main drivers behind the study was the enormous loss in buildings each year due to structure fires. So the study looked at insurance premiums for builder's risk insurance for 100,000 square feet apartment buildings using combustible wood frame and non-combustible construction concrete, basically comparing those two types of construction in a typical building in five U.S. cities, Edgewater, New Jersey, Towson, Maryland, Orlando, Florida, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and Los Angeles. The study revealed that insurance are aware of the risks of building with combustible construction, as well as the benefits of building with non-combustible construction. All of the insurance quotes showed that the concrete building was less costly to insure than the wood frame building. For builders risk insurance, the most significant difference was 72% less for the concrete building, and the smallest was 22% less for the concrete building as opposed to the combustible construction wood frame. For commercial property insurance, the greatest and smallest differences were between 65% and 14% respectively. Some insurance agents actually suggested that the gap between rates for wood frame and concrete is likely to grow in the future and that a growing number of insurance are actually declining to serve as the sole insurer for wood frame apartment buildings. Additionally, insurers of such building are increasingly require, requiring that the insured take extra measures to protect against fire loss. So we talked about structure fires. Here are some statistics on the cost of wildfires in the United States. According to various insurance solutions, four and a half million U.S. homes are at high or extreme risk of wildfire with more than 2 million of those homes in the state of California alone. And according to Munich Rea Reinsure, there have been $23.1 billion in losses to wildfires in the US over the past five years. And again, 2017, and not including this year, was by far the worst year with $17 billion worth of loss. And that number continues to grow due to climate change, which is creating warmer and drier conditions. And as we continue to build near fire prone areas, damages caused by wildfires will continue to increase. And I've listed here some statistics um, from 2017, 2018, and 2019 with the picture of, of the wildfire season, how many acres have been burned, buildings destroyed, and, and some of the fatalities, fatalities that have been incurred. According to Bloomberg Business Week, uh, their article entitled, Why is California Rebuilding in Fire Country? Um, because you're paying for it. Uh, they talk about the 1964 Hanley Fire in Sonoma, Sonoma County, which destroyed 100 homes. And if you compare that to the 2017 Tubbs Fire, which covered nearly the same geographic area, uh, the Tubbs Fire actually destroyed more than 5,000 homes and resulted in 22 fatalities. 
And what's most surprising that instead of building back to higher standards after these devastating fires, policy makers are actually issuing permits to rebuild without uh, requiring uh, updating of the building codes or, or these structures to be built to updated building codes or updated provisions of the building codes. They're even exempting residents from zoning rules so that they can actually build larger homes. Um, in some cases, state officials are, are mandating that insurance companies do not rate, raise their insurance rates uh, for people who live in fire prone areas. And in that way, they're actually passing the cost along to homeowners elsewhere. And it, it should be noted that in, in uh, 2017, the state of California paid nearly $700 million uh, for fire suppression. Uh, and that is alarming considering um, the other sort of recuperations that did not take place. And I have here some information about the current wildfires ongoing in California, Oregon, and, and Washington. This is from NASA's Fire Information for Research Management System, their firm system, uh, which does provide re real-time information a, a few hours uh, behind. Uh, this is actually a snapshot from a couple weeks ago, September 18th, 2020. Um, and you can see just the number of fires that were burning, um, how large they were. You know, some of them had started in, in mid-August. Um, you can see that the August complex fire uh, now has become the largest fire in modern California history uh, with 800,000 acres burned already. Um, the Creek Fire, of course, devastating the Sierra National Forest. And the Bobcat Fire, um, just 25 miles northeast of Los Angeles. And this again is a snapshot from September 18th. It does not include fires which have started afterward in the region, such as the Glass Fire, um, which just overnight has tripled in size, burning through Napa and Sonoma counties. Um, and so Oregon, Washington, and California are at this moment enduring the largest fires, um, but wildfires have also been burning this month in other states in Utah, Nevada, Arizona, Wyoming, and Montana. So although recent attention has been on California and the West Coast because of, uh, again, the major wildfires in 2017 and what's going on now, there are wildfire risks in most states and according to forest and rangelands you can see from this map um, the highest you know deepest orange color shows the counties with the greatest risk of wildfires um, characterized by higher than average annual area burned and you can see that covers a majority of the united states not just the western half um, but the southern half as well and this is really um, highlighting sort of how we're building closer and closer into the wildland urban interface. So for communities, building owners, occupants, investors, insurance providers, and citizens, um, the question is, is minimum life safety enough? You know, is adopting updated building codes established as a baseline for life safety enough the model building codes do establish a building, building's minimum requirements for design, but at the same time, the United States historically has one of the highest fire death rates in the industrial world. Uh, while civilian deaths are trending downwards, um, the risk of death in fire has not decreased over time and damages due to fire are increasing over time. So when we talk about model building codes and building code requirements, we have to note that codes are the minimum requirements, not the highest performing systems or highest performing buildings. And codes are really, again, bare minimum requirements. We say the basement of requirements. And in reality, the building code represents the, the worst performing building that you can legally build. And as we continue to talk about code requirements, the heightened area tables in the International Building Code have been historically the basis uh, for passive fire protection requirements. The maximum area per floor, the number of stories are based on occupancy type of construction, the presence of sprinklers, and the amount of qualifying open space around the perimeter of the structure. 
limitations were developed to contain a fire to a size that could be extinguished or controlled promptly and safely by the fire services, provide for the safety of occupants and to protect the building and adjacent structures. But alarmingly over time, the evolution of the building code and their requirements has resulted in significantly larger and taller buildings constructed with combustible materials. And it's been implied more recently in literature and advertising that mass timber construction, which is type four, behaves like fire resistive materials during a fire due to its insulating char layer properties on the exposed surfaces, which uh, reportedly protects the inner core during fire exposures. However, unlike fire resistive material, mass timber actually contributes fuel load to the fire, accelerating flashover potential. These structures, even with automatic fire sprinklers, are unlikely to survive the fire event and must be demolished and will not support property protection. I mentioned over time the evolution of the building codes to result in significantly larger and taller buildings constructed with combustible materials. Additionally, a number of trade-offs have been made based on the presence of active fire suppression systems to permit significant reductions in passive fire protection. I wanna pause on that for just a moment and share a study conducted by the National Association of State Fire Marshals, which conducted an extensive literature review and found that the concept of trade-offs actually lacks scientific justification. There's virtually no reliable data from a holistic building perspective on whether the cumulative effects uh, that make buildings and people safer can be drawn from those trade-offs. Fire safety, means of egress, and general safety actually declined by appreciable amounts with the adoption of the International Building Code over the legacy codes uh, pre-2000. And these were uh, some of the findings of that NASFM study. So we've talked a lot about uh, the impact of fires, both structural fires and wildfires, and sort of the overall, perhaps, absence in the building codes to look at, at our current situation. Let's talk no, now about the balanced approach to fire safety and what that approach actually should look like. I have here uh, some graphics from NFPA 550, which is the guide to the fire safety concepts tree. And this is a, a part of the standard which actually provides a visual representation of what the total concept of fire safety incorporated into codes and standards really looks like. This is a useful tool for fire safety practitioners to communicate overall fire safety and fire protection concepts and the relationships of fire prevention and fire damage control strategies. So you can see here in this tree, uh, fire safety objectives are really broken into two categories, objectives that prevent fire ignition and objectives that actually manage fire impact once fire risk has uh, occurred. And when we look at managing fire impact, we have again two camps. One is to actually manage the fire and one is to manage the pe persons that are exposed as a result of that fire. And I've highlighted two very important parts or aspects of managing fire. And that is, um, th and these are as it relates to the built environment and construction that we all deal with. And that is to actually suppress the fire and to control fire by construction. And if we look at um, drill down managing fire a little bit more and look at suppressing fire and controlling fire by construction, again, the standard actually builds out this tree depending on the different strategies that we're looking at. And again, we're focusing on construction. Controlling fire by construction, uh, again, looks at controlling movement of fire, but more importantly, providing structural stability in the structure and containing or confining the fire. And the suppression of fire looks to first be able to detect where fire is occurring and apply sufficient suppression. So these are, again, the overall strategy that we're looking at in controlling fire by construction and suppression. And I wanna highlight also detecting the need to put those two strategies into place is very important. Having the ability to detect when fire is occurring 
is also important part of life safety in causing the movement of exposed persons uh, in seeking evacuation. So if we take that overall picture of what fire protection strategies look like, we can then look at recommendations for a more balanced approach. Building codes do require designers to provide fire protection for buildings by combining active fire protection systems, uh, suppressing the fire with passive fire protection systems through the actual structure as it's built. This fire protection approach is what we call the balanced fire approach. Implementing balanced fire protection design provides the highest level of protection. And balanced design is a combination of three key elements, smoke detection, fire suppression, or cont and containment or compartmentation. And construction incorporating all of these three components in a strong manner provides valuable backup in the event of uh, failure of any of those, including an active system failure. Balanced design should be the standard for all buildings, including multifamily buildings. So smoke detection, fire suppression containment, and compartmentation places limits on the spread of fire to other portions of the building and uses fire resistive materials and assemblies, such as walls and floors to resist the spread of fire. Without the balanced design approach, one relies solely on the effectiveness and reliability on a mechanical system, which requires sufficient regular maintenance to provide fire protection. Fire containment through construction provides a reliable method to reduce the spread of fire and smoke, even when sprinkler systems or other systems fail. It should be noted that through prenotation, fire stop systems are a key component of fire containment and passive fire protection. Now that we've defined what a balanced approach to fire safety is, let's look at the specifics of what looks like more specific recommendations for implementing that approach and reducing risks from structure fires and wildfires. So we've, we've got recommendations here for different types of buildings and fire risks. We're gonna look first at multifamily structures. One of the most important aspects um, for incorporating a balanced approach uh, to fire safety in the design is to engage a fire protection engineer uh, from the beginning in the design of these structures. Automatic sprinkler protection is very much important and required. The construction type determined based on the number of stories from the lowest level of fire service access is very important and gets missed. Often it's measured from a, a podium level, it really does need to be measured from the lowest level of fire service access. Um, providing signage at the building entrance um, for light frame combustible construction actually helps the fire service to know uh, what type of building they have. And providing a, two, a minimum of two fire department access roads for projects that have more than 30 uh, dwelling units actually accommodate site fire and emergency vehicle access in a much better fashion than just a single fire department access to the building. If we look at buildings const under construction, and, and I mentioned uh, the, the number of you know, fires that we've seen in um, wood frame construction, a number of those fires have been in buildings under construction. Uh, so we have some recommendations here uh, one is to progressively clad exposed combustible materials with fire resistant coverings uh, to limit during construction the number of stories that have significant exposed combustible materials uh, to limit that to two stories below the current construction level. Also to progressively commission automatic sprinkler systems to limit the number of unprotected stories with significant exposed combustible materials. Again, we wanna limit that to two below the current construction level. Also to employ 24 hour fire watch and constru on construction sites, as well as uh, implement construction site intrusion detection. Uh, that is against arson and other threats to reduce the risk of fire. And there's many other recommendations and guidelines that can be found in NFPA 241, which is the standard for safeguarding construction alteration and demolition operations. And now we wanna look also at recommendations for wildfire safety. And we're gonna focus on uh, the codes that are available uh, 
to reduce the risks of wildfires. First, we have the International Wildland Urban Interface Code, the IWUIC. It's part of the ICC model building codes. It's also sort of the basis for uh, Chapter 7A in the California Building Code. And the overall objective in mitigating the risks of wildfire here uh, are to remove flammable materials from around the building and to also uh, encourage construction from building of fire resistant materials. And there are some more specific uh, provisions that come out of the IWUIC um, limiting the number of structures permitted in at-risk areas um, for building materials and construction. Uh, Non-combustible roof assembly, exterior walls, windows, and doors are required. The management of vegetation uh, around the building, emergency vehicle access, making sure that there are sufficient requirements for driveways, turnarounds, emergency access roads and marking of roads and property address markers uh, for the sake of the fire service that's responding to fires. Adequate water supply uh, from approved water sources so that there's enough water supply for firefighting. And finally, automatic sprinkler systems, spark arrested and propane tank storage, propane tank storage room uh, provisions to ensure um, adequate fire protection measures. A parallel code that's also used in some jurisdictions is NFPA 1144, which is the standard for reducing structure ignition hazards from wildland fire. Uh, this provides a slightly different methodology for assessing wildland fire ignition, um, assessing the hazards around existing structures, including residential developments and subdivisions that are located in the wildland urban interface area. And it provides minimum requirements for new construction to reduce the potential of structural ignition from wild fi wildland fires. And this is really a code that's used to assess fuel sources in the structural ignition zone for their potential and identify possible mitigation measures to reduce the possibility of structure ignition based on the hazards that have been identified. And some of the provisions that are in NFPA 1144 uh, for new structures include uh, provisions for having building materials that will not ignite, burn, or support combustion, or release combustible vapors when subjected to fire or heat. Uh, the building ma materials are required to maintain their fire performance and their mechanical performance under certain conditions of use. There's limitations on flame spread index of building materials, meaning that building materials do have to maintain a certain uh, maximum flame spread index. Uh, depending on the severity of hazard, class A roof coverings only are uh, allowed. Event assemblies and eaves do have to have uh, resistance to intrusion of flames and embers, very similar to uh, the IWUIC. And there again are um, provisions for non-combustibility, fire resistance and ignition resistance on exterior walls. There's limitations, similar limitations on overhanging projections uh, and requirements for exterior windows, windows and exterior doors, skylights and exterior doors, are, as these are a credible entry point uh, for wildfires to start in a building. So we've talked again about what the uh, balanced approach looks like, and we've focused a lot on building construction and non-combustible construction. The next few slides are going to really review the non-combustible building systems and finishes that we have access to. Uh, concrete frame construction, this is the large picture you see on this slide. Um, concrete frame, conventional reinforced concrete frame is made up of columns and one or two way slabs that have been the mode of multifamily construction and commercial construction for decades. More often today, slabs are post tension to reduce slab thickness and increase spans. Concrete framing systems are often used for high rise applications or for buildings that have a significant amount of glass on the exterior. Vertical loads are carried by columns to the foundation and slabs can be a two way flat plate two-way waffle or one-way slab and beams, pan joy systems, among others. The second picture we have on this slide is of insulating concrete forms, which is a type of bearing wall system. 
Many low to mid-rise buildings, including single family and multi-family are bearing wall type construction. Um, tilt up walls, precast walls, and concrete masonry are just a few of those uh, types of systems. Each having special advantages, one of the newer systems is ICF insulating concrete forms. And this is a system that uses polystyrene forms that are stacked in the shape of the wall, steel reinforcement that's added, and then concrete placed into the cavity that's formed. And the forms actually stay in place to act as insulation and substrate for electrical plumbing and finishes. In most cases, these design, these concrete bearing wall systems that I mentioned have rigid insulation incorporated into the wall, into the wall such as precast and tilt up sandwich panels and ICFs, or the insulation must be added afterward for uninsulated wall panels and concrete masonry walls. I do want to note that the insulation is treated with a fire retardant that has to meet minimum building code and reference test standard requirements for flame spread and smoke development. And here we have some additional non-combustible building systems and finishes. The picture here is of a, um, a precast floor. Um, for concrete frame systems, the floor is the primary component. Um, however, for bearing walls, there are several options. These include conventionally formed slabs spanning between bearing walls, uh, precast hollow core planks, and these have typically two inches of concrete topping or ICF floor systems, uh, similar to pan joy systems, except the forms stay in place. There are many cement-based concrete finish materials and products that can be used to increase fire resistance rating and reduce combustibility of a building. Plaster can be used as a finish system for most applications directly over the wall systems. Decorative concrete masonry that includes uh, split face, exposed aggregate, and glazed blocks. Um, and manufactured stone, these are some popular choices for higher end finishes. Fiber cement siding and soffits are ideal for reducing flame spread. And finally, concrete roof tiles can offer a non-combustible solution. So I have now four case studies um, really highlighting the role of concrete in pacifier protection strategy and overall balanced fire protection strategy. The first is uh, a massive natural gas explosion that occurred uh, in 2014 in East Harlem, New York City. This actually destroyed two apartment build buildings, vacated four neighboring properties and shattered windows blocks away. Bricks, wood, and other debris landed on the adjacent elevated Metro Railroad tracks, therefore suspending service to and from Manhattan for most of the day. Nearby buildings and households were affected by the blast. Um, they had to deal with the cost to remediate elevated levels of lead and asbestos. In total, the devastation caused eight deaths, 70 injuries, and displaced 100 families. There were over 200 firefighters, paramedics, and police officers that were responding to that incident that day. And the local utility was responsible for 153.3 million damages, and that's recorded as the highest payout for a gas safety incident in the state of New York's history. The story here is regarding the concrete building uh, adjacent to the blast, which survived uh, both that blast and the subsequent fire and really reopened almost immediately after repairs. The, this adjacent four-story concrete building stood strong. The New York Building Department's engineers report said that amazingly, there was no structural damage at all, even though the blast was located inches, not feet from the concrete walls but the building was in remarkably good shape. Uh, the only damage to the building was caused by falling debris from the blast next door, which actually penetrated the roof membrane and because of the fire suppression activities resulted in water damage. Uh, the building, however, um, was rebuilt uh, using insulated concrete form walls and was reopened. The building was originally built from insulating concrete form walls and after those minor repairs um, to uh, that membrane which was penetrated, it was reopened very shortly thereafter. So New York City um, and Chicago both employ fire district regulations to limit combustible construction 
uh, within urban, dense urban boundaries. Uh, there are a number of other jurisdictions also uh, that have fire district provisions. Um, Sandy Spring, Georgia, Los Angeles, California uh, are a number of uh, examples of some of those communities um, that have enacted ordinances to protect health, safety, and welfare of its citizens by limiting combustible materials. The second case study that I have is Walker's Landing. Uh, this actually consists of two buildings, six stories each, uh, with floor, four floors of residential uh, stories over two floors of parking. Uh, this is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The construction site was restricted due to a 10-foot setback requirement from a river, uh, a bridge, and two streets. So access for material storage and construction activities was very tight. The project was located on an infill urban site and it required, because of those uh, situations, conditions that I mentioned, it required fire rated exterior walls. So this scenario is actually ideal for concrete walls since they provide more than enough fire rating at a significant cost savings over wood frame, especially when compared to many other projects in the city that had to use fire treated wood, which is very expensive. So the developer chose to use ICFs, insulating concrete forms, for the exterior fire separations. And they chose this because in addition to the fire resistance, um, there was a thermal efficiency provided by ICF walls with the precast hollow core floors. Uh, and also there was a speed of construction that was permitted using this type of construction. Uh, construction projects are always on timelines and the developer found that the install speed uh, was increased significantly by using ICFs since they are fast and efficient to install. And we also have a case study here uh, from the wildfire in Laguna Beach, California in 2013. That fire consumed 17,000 acres of brushland, um, destroyed 366 homes, damaged uh, more than 500 in just a single day. And it also had a high demand on the water district system uh, for the water system uh, due to the fire suppression efforts that were involved. Six of the district's 22 reservoirs were completely drained during that fire. Um, the peak demand was approximately 20,000 GPM and approximately 16 million gallons of water um, was needed to uh, fight fires during that period. But there was a lone survivor protected by an envelope of non-combustible building materials you can see here in this picture. Um, this house was spared due to its construction and landscape design. Uh, the detailing included stucco cladding on walls and class A concrete tile roof that was sealed on the ends with concrete to hide any exposed wood under the eaves to prevent combustion. The house featured double paned glass, which helped to keep heat from igniting the draperies inside the house. And it also had landscaping zones of fire resistant plants that also helped. So the property had no tall flammable trees near the house. And our final case study is from New Martin Hall and New Hall B at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, these were part of a university revitalization program and the university chose ICFs for, hall, for walls and hollow core plank for floors. This is a significant case study because it's a student dormitory and there's uh, a lot of NFPA data that has been taken for fires in dormitories. Uh, these fires have actually increased 24% over the last decade and fire, fire departments have typically responded to 11 dormitory fires each day. Annually, we have about one death, uh, 32 injuries, and several millions of dollars in property damage. So in summary, uh, structure fires and wildfires continue to result in increases in losses in single and multifamily buildings. While building codes have evolved, in some cases they've increased the reliance on active fire protection systems and reduced reliance on passive fire protection systems. Uh, permitting taller and taller buildings to be built of non-combustible construction. A balanced approach to fire protection strategy reduces the fire risk in buildings and provides life safety as well as property protection. And non-combustible concrete construction contributes 
to an overall fire protection strategy by confining and containing fires and providing structural stability without significantly increasing costs. Certainly happy to take any questions that you may have uh, following this. Um, hi, Shamim. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. The first is, how are we uh, to balance use of concrete as a structural system versus the push for mass timber now because of climate change and ways to embody carbon? Sure, that's a, actually an excellent question. Um, and there's been a lot of, as I mentioned, advertisement for mass timber um, because of climate change. And also, you know, we, we do have the debate on embodied carbon going on. I will say that no amount of, of logging and mass timber production is going to combat the risk that we have from um, drier and drier weather and climate change. Uh, regardless if, if we build from timber, um, that risk is going to be there. And of course, uh, adding that combustible construction uh, is going to just make more fire risk. So if we're looking to protect property and people from fire, we have to think in terms of, of non-combustible terms. And there's a lot of work going on in all of construction to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. Um, and if we have some time, I'll, I'll ask for my colleague, uh, Lionel, to talk a little bit about some of the efforts that we've made in the concrete industry um, in, in the mode of, of carbon reduction. Wonderful. Another question that has come through was, were recommendations during construction being followed in the Notre Dame Cathedral fire in Paris, France? So the Notre Dame Cathedral is, is a unique situation because it's considered a, a historic structure. Uh, and, and a lot of times in, in historic structures, you have um, competing priorities. You don't want to necessarily change the fabric of what the structure looks like, um, but at the same time, you want to implement provisions that will protect that um, historical asset. Um, and these are some of the questions that are being looked at by the NFPA Technical Committee that deals with historic structures. I know that uh, the limited information that I do have regarding the Notre Dame fire, um, there were some considerations being looked at to provide um, active fire protection, such as automatic sprinklers. There was a heavy cost involved, and there were also concerns about sort of aesthetics and, and how that would be incorporated. In hindsight, uh, there's, there was probably a lot of scrutiny that's being placed on that. And, if that retrofit had occurred, uh, obviously it would have saved that cultural resource from, from the current destruction that it's experienced. Um, there has to be a balance between the cost um, and looking at you know, implementing retrofit of those systems. If you look at what the cost would have been to retrofit versus the amount of damage and the cost that's going to take to replace it, if you actually do that comparison, it's a much stronger case uh, for providing um, retrofit active fire protection systems. So I will say in answer to the question, um, you know, back in the day, the Notre Dame, you know, when it was constructed, probably met all of the requirements legally in place at the time. You know, today, if the same thing were to build, obviously there would be um, different requirements for both the active and passive fire protection strategy. Wonderful. Another question we have is why are insurance companies not creating incentives to build fire resistant and resilient concrete homes? Actually, they are. In a number of states now, there is um, uh, new provisions within the insurance industry that they've actually made um, legislation. I know in Mississippi, uh, we just had some legislation passed that actually legally mandates insurance companies to um, incentivize building safer, um, building more resilient, building non-combustible. Uh, and, and there are other uh, states as well that have done that in the past, um, Georgia, Mississippi, um, Alabama, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. The, the bill in Mississippi is actually unique because it, it mandates it. Um, it, it actually mandates uh, not only for residential properties, but for commercial properties as well, that um, for developers building uh, 
non-combustible and more resilient, they are, the companies have to provide uh, that reduced insurance premium. Um, kind of on the same line, if AHJ and insurance carriers will not mandate increased fire resistance, then why would developers and investors do so voluntarily? So this is a, a very good question. And I think the answer lies in, in the, the data and statistics that I provided at, at the beginning of the presentation in terms of the amount of loss that could be incurred um, by those developers. And as we continue to, to build more and more into the wildland urban interface, as our cities continue to grow and become more dense, um, that fire risk is there. And so even if AHJs and insurance companies are you know, not incentivizing building more resilient and building more fire safe, there is an incentive for developers on their own to recognize these risks and um, really look at protecting their asset over time and, and saving by putting those costs in now for better construction than having to deal with the cost and damage uh, of that loss later. Wonderful. Um, another question we have is the University of Texas Austin has developed a 3D printed house made with lava creep. If a house is made completely out of concrete, does it still have to have sprinklers or can this be a case for not having to have them? I, again, advocate very much for the balanced approach. You know, there, no building is perfect and there is a life cycle that occurs beyond the initial building. And if you, if you look at NFPA 550, fire safety doesn't just stop at construction. There's a whole management uh, and um, building operation cycle that occurs afterwards. Passive fire protection is very much weighted on maintaining the integrity of your walls, um, you know, ceiling penetrations. And as a building goes through its use, you know, people are always putting holes into it. You really need that combination of the passive fire protection and the active systems, the sprinkler systems, to really, you know, build that robust profile. Um, if there's a, a failure or a weak link in any part, um, you know, there's a balance. The other, you know, portion of that strategy takes over. There, you will find, you know, performance-based designs where um, an engineer may advocate for elimination of sprinklers or, um, you know, a combustible construction that's based solely on sprinkler protection as kind of the balance. Um, I, again, I don't necessarily advocate for that, but there is the concept of a, a performance-based design that you'll see um, that is employed. Um, and there are other measures that you could look at, but I would say, again, the balanced approach would be to have both the structural fire resistance and the automatic sprinklers. Okay, another question we have is, can you discuss the toxic concerns of polystyrene layer of ICF spurning, please. I'm actually um, going to address that, you know, from a fire resistance perspective. Um, I don't have access necessarily to the toxicity information of that, um, but I'd be happy to follow up um, with with the uh, the concern on that issue. Um, there are over overarching concerns sometimes with respect to the foam that's actually uh, part of the form in ICF construction. And from a fire resistance perspective, um, that foam does have fire retardant properties, otherwise it doesn't pass uh, minimum building code standards. Um, toxicity of foam that could occur during a fire situation is of concern. I will say that um, because of the concrete construction uh, typically, we haven't seen um, degradation of the foam system. Uh, again, there, there isn't in the finished construction state, there isn't exposed foam. And typically the fire resistance that's provided with that wall, it, it's a minimum of two hours typically. So we don't typically see a, a fire situation where the wall has degraded or the finishes have degraded to the extent that um, there is exposed foam that melts. There's very few evidential, uh, you know, historic stories, um, even in recent years of that occurring in the United States. Um, but in terms of other toxic properties, I'd be happy to follow up and, and address that concern later. 
Wonderful. I can actually connect you with um, the gal that asked the question. Sure. Um, one more question and then we'll do a quick wrap up. Um, in the case study on the gas explosion in New York City, fire districts were mentioned. Are fire district regulations still relevant today, given the advancements we have made in fire protection technology? Absolutely. And I, I say that because we still, even though those fire district regulations were developed, you know, in, in the early 1900s or late 1800s in some cases, as a response to sort of the urban conflagrations that we used to see, um, you know, the, the, the great fires that occurred in Chicago, Los Angeles, Baltimore, we still have those conflagrations in our cities today. Um, fires that start in a, a single structure and then um, spread to adjacent structures due to non-combustible construction. And so those provisions are still very much relevant today. And they also provide, uh, again, a, another defense in the wild, wildland urban interface where our cities are actually encroaching into that interface. Uh, wonderful. I just have a few closing remarks and then we can hand it over to Lionel for um, a few quick last statements. Um, if everyone's made it this far, we will submit you for AIA continuing education credit, which should appear on your transcript within two weeks. Again, a big thank you to our partner, National Ready Mix Concrete Association, Build With Strength, California Nevada Cement Association, and Shamim for pr making this presentation happen. Uh, as always, more resources and tools can be found on AIA California's website. And thank you for everyone joining us today. And we will see you next month for our Designing for Economy webinar. And I will now hand it over to Lionel. Thank you, uh, Hillary. Um, Shamim, can you just go to the next slide? I just wanted to offer uh, a, um, a service that we provide here at NRMCA as part of our Build with Strength program. It's called the Concrete Design Center, where we look at uh, projects and, and offer a concrete solution. Shamim is part of that effort, uh, mostly in the area of codes and standards, but uh, let me just uh, go to the next slide and try to describe what it's all about. So basically we provide system recommendations uh, for the concrete solutions. You know, if you come to us with a project early in design, we'll do a cost comparison of whatever system you were thinking about using uh, and, and offer a concrete solution to that. And we also uh, do specification reviews and um, we, we bring a team together to, tr to try to build that, that building for you. Uh, and, and this is all free. Uh, we're not going to design the building for you. That's for architects and engineers to do, but we do offer that sort of uh, schematic design level uh, recommendation. Next slide, please. We have uh, experts around the country uh, for California. It's Patrick Matchy, but really we have a big support team uh, of architects, contractors, engineers, uh, estimators, and so forth that can help you out on these projects. Next slide. And of course, our expert uh, codes and standards team, of which Shamim is a part, but we have structural engineers, architects, and, uh, and other experts that can provide, uh, you know, answers to que tough questions like fire uh, safety, uh, which is uh, not an easy topic to understand. That's why uh, Shamim does these presentations, uh, because it is very complex. Next slide, please. There's plenty of other resources for you to look at with regards to um, you know, building uh, with concrete. Some of them address that question about uh, sustainability of concrete. I, I do wanna point out that uh, there's a reason why concrete has 8% uh, of the, the, up to 8% of the world's carbon emissions. It is the widely used, most widely used building material on the planet. There's a good reason for that. Most other countries around the world uh, build with concrete because they understand the resiliency, uh, fire safety, and, and other benefits uh, of concrete. <clears throat> In fact, deforestation is the largest contribu contributor to um, uh, climate change at 12%. At so uh, I don't want to get into a wood versus concrete solution here because honestly, uh, you can build a very fire safe wood building. It just takes a lot more effort to do that. 
But it also, uh, I want to point out, there's some really excellent uh, webinars that you can now go um, take a look, look at at buildwithstrength.com slash education and concrete innovations that help uh, address different concrete innovations that can reduce carbon footprint, specifying sustainable concrete. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at other balanced design approach. Well, you, you already saw that one, environmental safety and so forth. But all, and then the top 10 ways to reduce concrete's carbon footprint. That video is in fact uh, on the California AIA's website. Uh, but if you just go to the YouTube channel, uh, buildwithstrength.com or build with strength YouTube channel, you can take a look at ways to reduce car concrete's carbon footprint. So there's no doubt that, yeah, there are benefits to building with concrete. It can have a higher carbon footprint, but we can reduce that significantly with a collaborative effort between the designers, contractors, and the manufacturers. Next slide, final slide, I believe. I just want to point out that we do have a, uh, a big conference coming up November 30th through December 10th called the Global Concrete Summit, where a lot of these topics will be discussed, especially in the area of sustainability. I'd encourage you to go to globalconcretesummit.com and consider attending. These are some of the speakers, some of them you know already, but um, a, great, a great lineup. Um, and I encourage you, if you wanna learn how to reduce concrete's carbon footprint, this is the, the place you should go. <clears throat> Next slide. I think that covers it. I just wanna say thank you to AIA, California, Hillary, and of course, Shanim for doing a great job and all of you for great questions. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Tuesday.